we are going to get into our last feature for this evening. But really quick, I do just want to give a shout out to Choke Cherry, to Liv Havens, uh, who could not be with us tonight. I don't know, some lame excuse, like I'm trying to finish college. Nah, I was like, <laughs> okay, whatever, Lisa. No, we we're super proud of Liv. Wish they could be here, but just beautiful book on GameRollingBooks.com. Uh, and with that being said, I just want to give a really quick introduction uh, to our last reader for tonight, uh, Devin Devine, uh, an incredible, wonderful uh, queer writer from Portland, Oregon, and I'm going to read the description for their book really quick. Uh, Devin Devine's debut collection, Drinking to Sainthood, is an unwavering portrayal of addiction, both the funeral and the wake. Drinking to Sainthood confronts the narrative of two addicts careening into love, the crumbling of a whiskey brine marriage, and ultimately the loss of Devin's estranged husband to suicide. This collection is a labyrinth to Devin Devine's sobriety, from journal entry to the hospital stay. This book is a biblical reconciliation of grief, a willingness to offer mercy and an invocation to forgive one's self. So please give a warm welcome, Devin. Thanks so much, MJ. Uh, wow, what a reading. This is great. It's really great to see the work of my pressmates um, in what an unusual year. Uh, I can't say unprecedented because uh, we know that that's not true. Uh, I will say unusual. So um, Speaking of my pressmates, I was so bummed that Lyd couldn't be here. And so I asked them if I could read a poem from their book. Um, I'm really hoping to drag Lyd on tour next year uh, and call our tour Grief Guys, because uh, both of our books are very fucking sad. Um, and <laughs> um, so this is a uh, poem I love from their book that uh, aligns uh, a lot with mine. Um, so this poem from Choke Cherry, which cover artist, Catherine, what? <laughs> uh, the talents are multiple. Uh, the poem is called, I Take the Pill with the Cyclops Name. I take the pill with the Cyclops name and dance with the candle in my hands until my ankles slip away from me. On a notepad, I write, my limbs feel like vegetables thrown around at a farmer's market. I assume that I assumed it would be important. Earlier, I read the book about addiction and told myself it was to understand my parents, their parents, and so on until their last names dilute. In a hospital, I once called the nurse carrying a balloon of morphine to me beautiful. One fist of wisdom teeth, another of hydrocodone. The only alcohol I've ever known blowing through me was as I tried to fall asleep in a photo booth. I am only my parents when I am in pain. I make sure that pain is lonely. I told a line when my useless skeleton decides never again. I dance with the avalanche until I remember. Uh, so that's from Lid's book. Wish they were here, but they're being a smarty, finishing undergrad, being brilliant, getting nominated for Entropy's Best of List. Bummer. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to read from my book. Um, yeah, I had uh, MJ read uh, my description. Uh, I, I don't know if it's like Zoom shows or whatever, but like hearing other people talk about me in the third person has become insufferable for me. <laughs> I like cannot do it. And like, I love my bio. I talk about nude beaches, but like, I just can't hear people talk about me. So I'd rather hear people talk about my, my book. Um, I am not going to give a content warning because the description of my book sort of does that um and i'm just gonna get down and dirty into it um how it could have happened i get home from tour and the dogs have been replaced by cats all of the house plants have doubled in size he greets me at the sidewalk beaming baby you did it baby you're home our mouths come together and i'm thankful to be back home the house is our house there are no bags under my eyes. I am so happy to be home. I could cry and I do. As he wipes away every tear, pets my hair. It is as the music starts and the credits roll that there is an ambiguous hope for a beautiful, better life. I stay, he gets sober. The house is our house. I get pregnant, he writes more books. He keeps doing comedy. I graduate with an MFA. My grandmother dies. We have an awkward but charming orgy with the new neighbors from Portland. I masturbate to a video of me from nine years ago sucking his dick. 
A baby cries. He cooks dinner. I cry. He pets my hair. I get a book deal. I go on another tour. The dogs are dogs again. He is still sober. I leave and I come home a hundred times. And every time there is an empty recycling bin. He dies. Old, dry, happy. I sit in our house alone. I go to the store. I come back with a bottle. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna dive through these and not take a lot of pause. Cause if I take pause, it's actually not fun. It's not like more fun. <laughs> uh, I just joked earlier that like I did a 45 minute uh, book like uh, reading at my book lunch, which I like, I gave myself an intermission, but it turns like 45 minutes of this book is too much for me and too much for an audience. Um, I'm very impressed when anyone tells me they read this in a single sitting. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you just can turn your empathy off crazy. And that's a talent. Um, <laughs> actually everyone that's read it in one sitting is like, I sobbed for hours. Thank you. <laughs> um, this poem is called March 8th, 2016. Waking up with blood on a t-shirt, I don't remember falling asleep in. I am not dead. The man next to me is not dead. This is not a thriller movie. Whiskey dancing is a better kind of dancing because the dance floor makes you slick. Ice cube down the curve of a back. I sweat Jameson that night and quite literally screamed, I love you into, the, into his open laughing mouth as a live jazz band crooned and yapped and we cawed like the crows circling a carcass. But love is the dead body here. Tony was the first to notice the blood on my roommate's silk dress I borrowed. We'd spend the next few months recollecting pieces of that night. A blackout is a puzzle scattered across sidewalks and neighborhood bars. Our Uber driver probably still has a piece of it lost in the back seat. A blood drop unnoticed on the black leather. Here is the violence, a small cut on my hand and me, inexperienced bartender who poorly wielded the dreaded peeler had bled through the bandage, a piece of the puzzle. I did this to myself. Here's the healing. I bled all over the city holding his hand, teetering in a ruined silk dress. As he walked me to work come morning, we laughed at ourselves, hung over in the night gone and so clearly dumb with love. I bought a Gatorade, joked about Christ and the resurrection, I wish I could see us then. Calm before the hospital siren, copious with hope in him alive. The day he did it, I described it as he finally did it. Or sorry, the day he died, I described it as he finally did it. Imagine me pretending I knew the ending to this movie. Worse, imagine the love of your life dying and thinking the blood isn't on my hands. Um, I put this shirt on today. It's, um, it, is, it is a shirt that was mine uh, that then became the shirt of Tony. Um, it is a silk floral shirt um, and it's one of the only articles of clothing I got to keep. Um, and I was really excited for that. And I haven't worn it since. Um, and I kept being like, oh, I'll wear it with the book. And so I thought I would wear it today. Um, Tony is one of the funniest fucking people I ever met. Um, uh, he got me into stand-up comedy and I like to think that he like laughs during me reading this all the time. Um, so I have to read poems um, uh, that I find funny sometimes. Um, and this is a poem I find deeply funny <laughs> and I can't explain it if you don't understand. Uh, Evan Williams has something to say. I waited for you. 18 months felt like 18 years. I did not miss you as much as you missed me. But isn't that all of your loves? Aren't you dwelling on the dregs, digging through the recycling bin? Aren't you always thinking if only we loved each other different? You know, you're right. It was only bad timing. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It was him. I love you, you wicked glutton troll. I love you, you glassy-eyed idiot. I love you, you shouting trash sprout. You know and I know, and yet we can argue from now until the dirt. Let's figure out the big question. It isn't angels or envy. So what came first, the addict or the bottle? Uh, 
Okay. Um, I had all these tabs and these are not for the order that's tonight. And so they're really making my brain fucking, <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone else does that where they're like, yeah, those were useful at one point. Why haven't they taken them off? I don't know. Um, where are you? There it is. Um, yeah, uh, my very silly husband uh, <laughs> uh, encouraged me to do so much. Uh, one of those things was write and be a writer. Uh, he was uh, an addict from the moment I met him. And the very first summer we were together, we wrote a crime noir novel. And um, I have to explain this because I only believed in my writing because he believed in my writing. But Tony was like a pretty middle of the road writer. <laughs> like he was okay. And one of the sweetest things was like having him come into slam and starting to slam and like read poems and do terribly. And then like, finally, like I'd like edit his work and he'd do better. And it was very, very sweet. And part of the reason why he was a terrible writer is because he always fucking wrote drunk. He always wrote drunk. And it was so impossible to get him to edit his own work. And uh, we watched a, multiple movies and documentaries about Hemingway and I just would watch them and be like oh that's why you can't fucking edit is because you're obsessed and you think you're fucking Hemingway <laughs> and so uh, this poem is called Hemingway and Hadley likely argued outside of La Duma Go or love is another addiction. I can still hear my name barked from across the street, a cigarette flicked, October skirt. I darted frog-legged to his side. He twirled me, je ne sais quoi, glittered tongue tutting, smoke and sidewalk, my whiskey glazed smile, moon thirsty, an ache launched our hips to clink together. The most in love I have been was when I was most unst unstable. Depression is soluble, cobblestone, cobblestone slick and rain, and disease is reluctant truth, divulging my brain until the rot is what our fucking tasted like. None of us who loved him knew happy ever after, certainly not me. Still, I can't shoot a gun or hold one, a barely worn grief and the profound belief of an after death, a dreamt whisper in a quarter, sien or sticks, Midnight and smoking, I am sorely reminded. Yes, I met, then loved an unwell man, and I am better for it. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of similar to Phoebo, I had like a double stacked release date. Uh, the day before my book came out, I was two years sober. And I did that to myself because I was like, I'm going to reward my sobriety with my book coming out. And uh, sort of the thing that happened as I was like, probably though like it was probably the worst I've been mentally because I just was like you can't fucking relapse uh <laughs> before this book comes out because that's kind of the whole shtick dude <laughs> um but the book's in the world and I still have no plan to relapse um but like, whew, pressure was on for a minute there. I was just like, you can't, you can't, because that your 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 readings will suck. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, here's a. I'm a, I, I'm gonna try to chat a little bit less. Here's another one. Uh, Last supper. Uh, this one's because I know that Adrian really likes this one. Uh, when my love was brimming, he would take our dog and sit her on the sit her on a stool in the center of the kitchen. She watched as he danced and sang and swayed and chopped onions, mise en place, everything in its place. He cooed. He took me to Oregon in the fall, led me to the soaking wet forest, pointed at the gold growing under moss, and gifted me a love of mushrooms. He held a delicate bite of chanterelle up to my lips, knew when to ask if I wanted more. The first time I saw Tony, I was working in a French restaurant. He and his very pretty girlfriend were at brunch on a Monday. He ordered the pate and a mimosa before noon. We laughed until we cried watching Chopped, joked about dying of starvation while we watched Survivor. When he got sober right before bed, he ate bowl after bowl of cereal. When Anthony Bourdain died, he refused to get out of bed the next day. For a week after, no reservations was always on the TV. The happiest I saw him was with a knife in his hand. The happiest I saw him was in a kitchen 
I know what it is like to look at a fridge full of food and grab the bottle for nausea to claim the first six hours of a day. I see him embalmed, icebox skin and his mouth nearly looks the same. I lean into his face and I stand up shocked. My stomach turns, my mother is behind me and says my name. He is not dead. He is in Budapest with Anthony Bourdain. He is in the kitchen washing dishes. He's letting the dog lick his fingertips. He's smiling at me in a diner and we are laughing. It might as well be a Monday and love might as well be forever. We are out to brunch. We have spent hours sipping mimosas. We forgot to order food and we are planning a honeymoon, a honeymoon to Cuba that will never even go on. His ashes are at my mother's. I need to bottle them for his friends. I have this great idea that will take him across the world. I picture our last meal somewhere in Panama or Japan, or maybe it'll be me in a small mason jar sitting for hours at the satellite diner. Um, uh, this is because I know that there's a couple people here who know a thing or two about grief. Uh, if anyone's never bottled ashes, uh, fun thing I found out, they're not like dusty. There's actually like matter. <laughs> and I actually tried to do, I tried to like parcel out Tony. One of the worst experiences of my life. Turns out you can't put ashes through a funnel. Um, there's just a dark moment for anybody that knows. Um, I'm gonna do uh, one more. I didn't pay attention to time. Uh, I'll do two more, two more, two more. Um, after <gasps> Oh, everyone else did a new poem. I'm gonna do one more and then a new poem um, because everyone else did new poems. I'm gonna fit in. I didn't know that was on the memo, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, my book cover, it is uh, this, uh, it's the hand, it's stigmata. Um, one of the things that's very prevalent in this book is like, I have this lens of like, faith and Christianity and God at one of my like book release re or book launch things a friend asked me like what character God was in my book the good guy or the bad guy and I was like fuck you are it's too smart to be reading my book but this is the thing uh so much of my understanding of a belief in a higher power has been informed in my journey in sobriety and um I uh, also have like a shit ton of religious trauma. And so like, that feels like an incredible thing to say. Um, this last poem I'm going to read for my book is based on <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> um, and so it references Deuteronomy and revelations. I will spend, I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. Deuteronomy 32, 24. I am sorry I left. I want to absolve myself, wash the house clean, pretend the grass never died. I want to rush back to the love of a front doorstep. There is an instinct to be guilt-free. I do not think I was on his list of prayers as he slurred his last words to God. For fuck's sake, there was a three pound box of chicken wings on the coffee table three days later. Who cleans the house of shedded skin other than the spouse who is still alive. There is no way I can apologize to the container of ashes then won't make his girlfriend hate me. Hate is an is a word easy, uh, sorry. Do you ever think you have your poem fucking memorized and then you don't? Uh, may, won't make his girlfriend hate me more than she already might. Hate is a word easy to matchmaker with grief. I hate him for never finishing a story. Rather, I hate that he finished the story. I hate endings, last bites of ice cream, never watching the finale, leaving the theater before the credits, or this a meditation on self-blame as a mechanism to wallow. Pity party, reservation for one at the restaurant he always said was overpriced. Fate isn't cheap. We sat like stacked shot glasses, one inside of the other. I can't hate him without hating myself. And I'm always in the business of naming my addictions. Shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them, upon them, nor any heat. Revelations 7:16. The kitchen table waited for us to sit down. We found our bodies on the living room floor. I can recite his spine like 12 steps directly into heaven. I would stare at him. 
eyes watering until his jaw went slack. His mother wanted to bury him. Can't get Uma Thurman's fist out of my mind, as if he is less dead. Rather, he is played by his haunting likeness, Tom Hardy. In the next Tarantino bloodbath, there are no good movie endings. I am once again choking on a popcorn kernel, trying to chew through this. I always offered him the last bite and I am sorry. I was not there to feed him that chicken wing supper. Licking hot sauce from my cuticle. I am sorry if he went hu hungry before the light broke. I am sorry for the gambrel hanging. His body cold as a freezer. I left him and I still want to cook dinner for myself. I am not sorry I found other mouths to feed. My mouths, all of them wretched beasts, discipled with forgiveness, ready to devour. That's from my book. I'm going to read a new one and then we're going to be fucking done. I think MJ is going to uh, talk probably one more time. Because um, you should tip all of us for being here. <laughs> uh, this poem's a new poem. It's... Uh, it references the Talking Heads. If you don't know the song, I'm so sorry. If you know the song, you will like the song. <laughs> Once in a lifetime, you accidentally buy a lake after the Talking Heads in a conversation with my ex, Peter, about crying. You didn't open with the whole crying thing. This real estate agent, or sorry, the real estate agent failed to tell the buyer of this 20 acre lot of the three miles in the far east corner that hold a water reservoir. Clearly this is a lake and lakes are of course beautiful. Imagine or an oar cutting the surface, sun abhorrently delightful and the charm of this property is that it was for sale by owner, no foreclosure necessary. Though funny, the agent did not mention the lake. How did I get here? You found it wandering the wheat field, plowing away in your cottage core dream state, knee high mud ruckers doing their job. Suddenly there is a swarm of seagulls lingering in the air and you think this is not natural. This is not good. There are 10 bodies of water and this is all of them. Unsettling as a body floating face down, I've been asked where I went to while sitting next to someone I love. Unmarked, no signs, but upon hiking the entire water's edge, you find the small creek and the even smaller dam. Almost silly how this reservoir has been around for years and no one has thought to name it. But before all this, it could have been a river before the cement was poured. At the bottom of this reservoir are the dead bodies of all my loves who have died because they got tired of remaining. 30% of us is blood and tissue and a heavy dumb brain and a waterlogged heart, hidden obstacles. The rest is a reservoir. There are 10 bodies of water inside a body. A death in the home is not considered a defect. A burst pipe is. Someone bought this property without knowing. This is my beautiful house, but this cannot be my beautiful lake. If the advertisement showcased it, if the property listing said, this reservoir is man-made, may it be forgiven for that. The rain makes the fish sing. Every body that hangs drowns. Every body that drowns, I am trying to save. There are many other qualities to this piece of property. They are easy to enjoy. Do not try to swim here. With gusto, the real estate agent tried to sell you a dream home. Fervently, they are simply doing their job. They knew you would find it. They knew you would not refuse testing it for yourself. Wow, come on in. The water's fine. Thanks. Wow. Oh my God, what a good night. What incredible readings. Jesus, that was beautiful. Like. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the readers tonight, Anthony Febo, Grab, Catherine Weiss, Devin Devine. Seriously, uh, it's been so lovely to work with each of you and to put these beautiful books. Look at these. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look at this little bundle right here. Hint, hint, Josh, not Josh. Uh, look, at, look at this, look at this group. Uh, it is honestly, we really appreciate that 
you trusted us to put these books out in the world. It has been a blessing to work on each of these and to continue to put them out there. There's only so much more to come. Thank you for everyone for coming out. You could have been anywhere in the world and you decided to hang out with us and listen to some poems from some really awesome books. And we appreciate you for that. Uh, we'd love the support. Um, if you like what you heard tonight, uh, it would be nice if you could throw a little something, something, uh, a little tip. <laughs> we'll suggest a donation to the Game Over Books Venmo. Uh, it's at Game Over Books, uh, and it will go to the speakers tonight for their time and for being incredible and wonderful and looking fantastic. Uh, and <laughs> uh, on that note, I just want to say good night. Treat your souls well. Have a beautiful rest of your evening. Have a good weekend. Be with your loved ones and be well. I'll talk to you all later.